Welcome back to Impulsive, the number one podcast in the world. That's a statistical fact. Uh, I know what you're thinking. Logan, you're, you're not on your typical Impulsive set. And you're absolutely right. The backdrop behind me is probably not fooling you. There's a good reason for that. We have a very, very special guest today. One of the biggest crowds we've had as well. I, there's got to be, what, 700 to 1,000 people. Closer to the ladder. Yeah, yeah, standing behind the cameras right now. Hit that subscribe button, guys. Uh, I'm going to say before this episode starts, take out a notepad. Honestly, this could be one of the most impactful, impulsive episodes we've ever had with one of the most special guests we've ever had. And it's actually why we're sitting outside. I got the opportunity for my dear friend and ex-roommate, Andre, to have this guest on our, on our podcast. And he said, the only way the only way he'll do it is if you if we were we able to do it outside. And obviously with a studio in my garage, that doesn't count. I said, you know what? We'll move it outside for this guy. Because I really do, I, I believe in him and I was able to attend uh, an event that you guys had the other day. And I, I just learned how, how badass and how full of wisdom this guy sitting across from me is. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we have in our presence one of the most prominent, most viewed spiritual gurus in the world on the premises. Ladies and gentlemen, Sad Guru. My maid, Maria, found out you were coming. She I started. saw her standing behind the van and shooting me. She, she was sweating. <laughs> I said, Maria, why are you sweating? She said, I love this guy. I follow all of his stuff. And she said, I think she's here somewhere. She's right over there. She is so excited for you to be here. And uh, when I was at Andre's, you know, we're all waiting for you to show up. And I don't know what to expect, right? But you come cruising in on a motorcycle, took off your helmet, and it's like a divine light just like was shining down on you. And then you took your seat, sang a hymn, and gave these nuggets of wisdom that made so much sense to me. And you caught my attention when you began speaking by saying you were the one that was skeptical of everything. I'm like you. See it to believe the type of guy. You're trying. <laughs> I'm trying, so that's why I started growing out my beard because yours is obviously so long, plentiful, bountiful, and full of wisdom. But uh, you caught my attention because the things you were saying seem so grounded in reality. They seem so 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 uh, believable and practical, utilitarian and applicable to life, and they made sense to me. So just happy to have you here, uh, Andre. Again, thank you for making this happen. You know. Uh, lot about him and I, I want to turn to you to, to give us some talking points on, on where to start because one thing I, I learned in, in just listening uh, to the event you held the other day was the man knows everything he's got the answers to everything no you know you do you have the answers to everything we, we're going we got some we got some you know relationship problems we want to ask because, you uh, none of us know what is everything so it's okay <laughs> Fantastic, fantastic. So, uh, yeah, brother, just appreciate you. Um, how you doing? Thanks for joining us today. Uh, just rode, rode uh, for an hour from outside of L.A. Whoa, the, 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 the tarmac is burning hot. Yeah. This is nice out here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's hot today. So you've just been traveling the past month over all across America on your motorcycle, correct? Yeah, and activating the conversation of spirituality and you know, getting to witness the beauty that the spiritual um, people here have and with the indigenous people and Native Americans. And so what has been the most fascinating thing um, that you've been revealed and, and seen through your travels past month? Well, uh, there are too many things you'll need many days to listen to that. So let me tell you the most prominent thing that stuck in my mind is uh, Mato Tipila which is unfortunately today being referred to as uh, the Devil's Tower. It is a phenomena that all of you young people must experience. It is so incredibly powerful and so rare. I don't think that form of energy which we refer to in the human body, can I elaborate a bit? Or sure. this is just an introduction <laughs> So, uh, in the human body we recognize 
that for us to be so complex as... You know, we are the most complex creatures on this planet, which a whole lot of human beings are suffering, unfortunately, but the complexity is what makes our life rich. To make this life so complex, there are many... our energies are finding expression in many different ways. We identify one hundred and fourteen different ways in which it's finding expression. Of this, it is categorized as seven, so seven categories, which I think in California you would have heard of seven chakras and stuff like that. In this, there is one particular chakra which is referred to as the Vishuddhi, a region which is in the throat region. This is uh, normally in, I would say, ninety-nine percent of the human beings, it remains uh, in its seed form throughout their life, it never blossoms, this one aspect. Because if this blossoms, there is such power to that human being that he can touch beyond his physical reach, literally touch, I'm saying. Physically, you can touch life which is beyond your physical reach, you can see things beyond your visual capabilities. So, this is one of the most rarest aspects of human development, which happens only with a very few people who are concertedly focused on that. But here, there is a natural structure exuding that dimension in such a powerful way. In many ways, as I've been looking at the Native American culture, their spirituality and how they express themselves, when I see uh, in many, many ways, the fundamental is this energy source, because if anybody wants to uh, propagate or transmit spiritual process, trans transmit mystical dimensions, it's very important that there's a solid energy source. I was always wondering, where is that energy source? Because we always create one. Before we transmit, we create an energy source which is always like a backup. Without that, you will dissipate yourself. But here, there's a natural formation which is standing uh, over eight hundred feet, phenomenally reverberating. It's a must for all of you young people, you must experience this. I, uh, I wanna, I wanna get into how you started this spiritual journey. I found that fascinating um, when I listened to you speak at Andres. You were 25 years old. Mm -hmm. Still am. <laughs> Still am, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> Multiple successful businesses. And uh, you were praising the town as, as being a, a man of success, a man who had made it. And I, I probably should let you tell the story about your life. Again. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I asked, I'm, I'm sure you've told this story so many times, but you know, our audience hasn't heard it, or some of them may have, some of them may have not. And I know when I first heard it, I found it fascinating. So may, maybe just a brief uh, introduction of how you got started into knowing everything in the universe. <laughs> I'm serious, he has all the answers. Wait till he starts, bro. <laughs> So, uh, see, I... this happened to me when I was just about four and a half years of age. Suddenly, one day I realized, actually, I don't know a thing. Don't know a thing means just don't know anything. If somebody gives me a glass of water, I would be staring at this glass of water for hours. Because I don't know what is water, I know how to use it. Even now, you know how to use water, but do you know what it is, really? Two hydrogen molecules and one oxygen. Really? <laughs> That's textbook nonsense. <laughs> but, but what are molecules? But what are atoms? Like that? Right now, two-thirds of the planet is water, covered with water, covered by water, rather. It is available in all the three states, it's liquid, solid, air, g gaseous, everything. Wherever if we want to search for life, we search for a drop of water. Somebody finds a drop of water, a trace of water in Mars, and now we think life is possible. So this is the very basis of our life. But do we know what it is? Actually, with all the scientific exploration, we do not know a single atom, we know how to use it. We... <laughs> in the, even the invisible atom, we know how to break it, how to fuse it, how to make a bomb out of it, how to kill everybody from it, but we don't know what it is. We don't know what it is. So if I find a leaf, I'm staring at it for four hours, five hours. If I sit up in the night, I'm just staring at darkness for hours. My father being a physician, he started thinking that I need psychiatric evaluation. <laughs> Doctors, you know. <laughs> yeah, maybe. 
So, <laughs> see. Oh, it's him, I thought. <laughs> so, in this condition, they sent me to school. My mother said, uh, you must pay attention to the teachers, you're always at something else. So, I went and paid attention to the teachers. The kind of attention that they had never imagined anybody would pay to them, nobody had ever paid that kind of attention. I sit there and I know their past, present and future, staring at them, staring at them, staring at them. Sometimes somebody said, don't stare at me like this. I'm just a little boy, four, five-year-old boy, <laughs> but they're kind of uncomfortable the way I'm staring at them. So I went to school and initially they started saying things and I sort of understood what they're trying to say. And then I realized, teacher after teacher coming and making actually sounds and sounds and sounds. See right now, I'm making sounds. Because both of us think we know English language, you are making meaning out of this. Suppose I start speaking in any one of the Indian languages, they will be just sounds for you, isn't it? We're just making sounds. This language is a conspiracy between two people. I make this sound, you make that meaning. I thought I make that sound, you make that meaning, you know? This is the whole thing. So I stopped making meanings and just started listening to the sounds. And uh, every forty-five minutes a new teacher will come and make sounds and sounds and sounds. It became very amusing and a big smile spread on my face. But they were not amused at all <laughs> So I saw that there was no point and I went to school only when it was absolutely necessary. The rest of the time I kind of... I was... had more interesting explorations in the world <laughs> So one day it happened, I mean now about uh, eleven years ago, this school where I studied almost forty-five years ago or more, they came to invite me for their one hundred and twenty-fifth anniversary, school anniversary. I said, see please, uh, why me? I was not just a bad student, I was not even a stu student, I only came when it was absolutely necessary, why me? They said, uh, see, our school has produced ministers in the cabinet, our school has produced sports stars, our school has produced cinema stars, but you are the only mystic, so you must come. I said, okay, and I went <laughs> I went there and stood up in the quadrangle to speak. I looked around, same oppressive buildings. And then I looked at this particular room and then I remember, I was around twelve years of age, one afternoon, uh, because at that time I'm in this condition, I don't know anything. If I pay attention to something, I can't take my eyes off it. I'm just looking at it, still trying to figure it out, what is it? So, they can't get my attention. So, he asked me a question, something. I just look at him. I don't even hear the question, okay? I hear sounds. I don't make meanings out of it, something. Everybody's blabbering something all the time. So, I just look at him. And he tries to get an answer from me for about thirty-five, forty minutes, he tries hard to get... make me say something. When I don't know anything, what is there to say? So I was in that condition at that time, for many days I wouldn't speak. Because there's nothing to say, what is there to say? I don't know a thing. So I was just looking at him. After thirty-five, forty minutes of frustration, he got so mad. He came and held me by the shoulder, shook me violently like that and said, you must either be the divine or the devil, I think you're the later. Well, I was not insulted or abused by this. My problem is, what is this, what is that, what is that, what is that? One thing was clear, this is me. This guy confused me about this also. I look like this, what is this? Is this divine or devil? What the hell is this? Suddenly I didn't know, what is this? Till now I was okay, I did not know what... anything about anything, but I knew this is me. Suddenly this guy confused me. So that is when I started sitting with my eyes closed, trying to see, what is this? Well, it took a few years, another twelve, thirteen years, before I realized, what is this? And what was that? Huh? What was that? <laughs> <laughs> see, right now, what you call as myself, is largely the boundaries of your body. We can do an experiment, actually. Can you? Sure, let's do it. So, uh, you hold both your hands together. 
And uh, with your eyes closed, what you do is you intensely rub it like this for about thirty seconds, as intensely as possible. It's gonna get hot. I don't like this. I really don't like it. Now, so I do where my skin is burning. Now hold your uh, palms about four inches away from each other. Something happening between them? Some kind of sensation happening between them? Yeah. Yeah, my hands are hot. Not about hands being hot. Between the two palms, is there something happening? I don't know. Please try it again, not... not... not with pressure, but with speed. Yeah. It feels like there's like a magnet between yeah. the two. So there is a sensation. What I'm trying to tell you is, how did you fix the boundaries of your body? See, right now, do one thing. T take your right hand and touch your left hand. Is that you? Is that you? Yeah. Yes. Touch the chair on which you're sitting. Is that you? No. How do you know this? Because I, I, I can get off of it and walk away in the chair. Oh, this... Uh, a whole lot of people have walked away from their body, haven't they? What about all the dead people? Huh? Don't they come back on Halloween? I think... I think uh, the most important notion here is to understand that human experience is 100% self-contained, which you talk about. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. That's not what I'm saying. See, right now, you're fixing the boundaries of who you are only from the boundaries of sensation. Where there is sensation, it's you. Where there is no sensation, it's not you, isn't it? Could I, could I just ask a question? I don't want to get too far ahead, but I want to bring this back for the impulsive audience who may not be aligned with this way of thinking or know who you are exactly or your, or your, or your approach. I have uh, uh, have always been one to have a tough time with, with all of this. Me and Andre have had many conversations about it, I'm open-minded to it, but at the end of the day, I always have a Verizon bill to pay. I have uh, health insurance that uh, needs You go to the phone bills. No, no, if you don't use the phone, there are no bills, actually. Oh, okay, oh. great. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but I, great, I li and I love that, but I've got, I've got bills. No, 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 let's, uh, let's come to the Verizon later. Right okay. now, First of all, how do you define who you are and what you are? Essentially, whatever is within the boundaries of your sensation is you. Whatever is outside the boundaries of your sensation is something else, isn't it? Say, right now, this water in this vessel, the, is this you? No. Before paying the Verizon, you need to drink water, all right? Yes. Is this you? No, it's not, it's not. It's not. No. <laughs> it's, see, like I said, yes, it's hard listen, for me listen, to even get on your level to answer the no, question, no, no. is the water in the glass me? You no, know, I've been taught that yes. the water in the glass is not me. Yes, but if I'm you drink it, here. if you drink it, <laughs> will it become you? See, that's where I don't... I don't know. No, no, right now, two-thirds... two-thirds of your body is water. So it, or, it is me then. It is you. Okay. But then is it still you in the toilet after you pee it out as well? Uh, that's up to you to decide. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then you'll get flushed out. What are you, you, you going to decide? Well, it, I feel like it's more... kind of goes through, you know what I mean, like a no, car... No, it doesn't go through, please. Hello, hello, it's not like gas. I know, it's not like gas or engine oil. Here, your body is a certain composition of food that you've eaten, water that you drank and the air that you breathe. Yes or no? Yes. So right now, we're just using water as an example. If it's here in this vessel, it's definitely not you, it's hundred percent clear. But the moment you drink it, it goes and integrates itself into this body on some level. A part of it may go out, that's a different matter, but the rest of it stays, all right? So now that it is here, this water which is in this body, are you not experiencing this as myself? Mm. Yes. Yes or no? Yes. May I ask a question? And then no, like this is a legit question. I'm very new to this. No, you're not new to life. I'm only asking you simple questions. I don't know. Sometimes I wake up and I'm like, okay, I'm here today. <laughs> uh, my my question is this: uh, If the water is me and I drink the water, no, no, I didn't say it's you. I just asked your question. <laughs> Oh, okay. So is it or is it? It not? wasn't. He, well, he's in the, he's in the middle of a spiel, bro. He's not done yet. So maybe maybe put a pin in your question. No, no. The simple thing is this: Is it true, your body is an accumulation of food, water, air, and whatever else you consumed? Correct. Yes. yes. So similarly, the water is here. It's not you. You know that. But the moment it's inside, you experience this as myself, isn't it? Mm. Why? 
because it's within the boundaries of your sensation. So your idea of who you are is only because of the boundaries of your sensation. If you touch this, you know this is not me. If you touch this, you know this is me. Because there, here there are sensations, here there are no sensations. But boundaries of your sensation can be stretched. Simply if you did this, you will feel sensations between your arms, between your palms. Well, you have heard somebody had a whatever an unfortunate incident and they chopped off somebody's leg. And uh, still, the experience of leg is still there, though the physical leg is not there. Because there is a sensory body, as there is a physical body, there is a sensory body. This sensory body, how large it is, depends on how intense your life energies are. If your life energies are very effervescent and intense, your sensory body becomes larger than your physical body. Why everybody is rubbing each other all the time is because they want to experience somebody else as a part of themselves. If your sensory body became as large as this space, you would experience everybody here as myself. This is what you are thinking is love, this is what you are thinking is sexuality. All that's happening is your sensory body, because of a certain moment of exuberance, has expanded. Because it's expanded, somebody feels like they're just a part of you at that moment. So now, what yoga means is, you make your life energy so exuberant, it takes some work. You make it so exuberant, if you sit here, the entire universe is a part of you, because your sensory body is stretched like that. So your whole experience of life as to what is you and what is not you is determined by where there are sensations, it's you, where there are no sensations, it's not you, isn't it? Correct. I'm on board. Everybody is. <laughs> you have no choice. <laughs> where, where I was going with that question, and I'm trying to phrase it the right way. Is Jeez, just just change the phone company. It, leave, leave the phone. <laughs> forget the phone company. We don't need phones, right? I guess. I guess. And even in half the country, that phone company doesn't work. <laughs> right. Got it. I, where I was going with it is is just that I think to a, a lot of people that listen to this conversation, this is a a. a the conversation itself and the entire thought process is, is viewed by, by many people as a luxury. A luxury that many people don't have the time, the ability to, to uh, sit in and to understand where does my life force end. I have four kids. We live in a one bedroom, you know, apartment in New You York shouldn't City. have made four kids if you have only one bedroom. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. Thing. Cool. Well, I get, all right. I get it. Now we're talking about you know the moral, morality of parenthood. I, I get it. But what I'm saying is, people find themselves in circumstances, whether they plan to be there or not, and life has a way of dictating how much energy we can we can devote to this type of extracurricular. Some would call it paranormal. Some would call it no, you know no. theoretical. No, no, no. Thinking. You, you just, should not. You should not. This no, question. one second. You oh, should God. not put labels on things that you don't understand. Perfect. You just okay. say right now, I don't have time. I don't have energy to do that. I will come to that. Okay. Okay. But don't put names on this. That this is extracurricular. It's not oh, extracurricular. God. It is most fundamental to life. Mm. If you want to live a sensible life, it's important that you know at least what is the nature of your existence. Without knowing the nature of your existence, if you try to handle this, you'll make a fool of yourself with the world. Right. So now that we know that, got it, and you ran us through that, now that we know the nature of our existence... No, 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 we don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's no, not how it works. <laughs> I'm the water that I drank. <laughs> no, no, you don't come to a conclusion like that. It is opening up one possibility. This is for you to wonder what is the nature of my existence, which he thinks is a luxury. I'm saying it's like this. You want to handle something, let's say you want to handle this camera. You know nothing about it and you handle it. What will you produce, I'm asking? It's probably, probably some horseshit. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> that's what life is for most people, that's what he's saying. Horseshit. In yeah. one room they had five children, why? There's one room, you should know what to do <laughs> I, 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 I'm with you. My, my, I guess my question is, if I go to the grocery store, right, and I get to the register and I'm buying my lettuce and all of my organic vegetables, and I get to the register and they say, you know, that'll be sixty-two fifty. No, no, and this, I explain this organic I, vegetable and all is too extracurricular. Just uh, buy it in Walmart. Huh? <laughs> okay, so I'm at the Walmart counter and, I, and they ask me for sixty-two dollars, and I say, but I have found out the fundamental principles of life, and I have a life force that exists be, in between my hands when I rub them together. I, what, I, what I'm getting at is how do you, how do you enthrall 
and ignite the masses to take part in this conversation about what life means. That's where I was trying to get to with this whole question. That's what I was well, taking a long See, I wanted to, I wanted to understand, you're dismissing a whole lot of human beings as masses. There are no masses, there are individual human beings everywhere. If you, if you have the patience, if you have the compassion, if you have the involvement, even if you go into the slum, there also there are individual human beings, there is no slum dwellers there. Hello? Right. Yes or no? Yes. yes. This mass of people, there's no such people, there are individual human beings, every one of them is concerned about his or her life, every one of them want to live well. I'm saying, if you want to use the camera well, the first thing is, to read at least the instruction manual, even if you don't go for a training, isn't it? Hello? Isn't it so? So I'm just talking about the instruction manual for such a complex machine that's been given to you. The most sophisticated technology on the planet is this one, the human mechanism. Without knowing a thing about it, if you think you can handle it well, you cannot. <laughs> If I can just interject here real quick, I think that for me when it comes to spiritual seeking, it boils down to the question of who am I, right? What is the nature of my existence? And the pointing, right, is to understand who I am, I have to first understand who I am not. And so I feel like he was um, touching on like under, most people are so identified with their mind and their body processes and they think that is them. And so I think what he was trying to do is give a distinction as to the separation of, of who you are and what your mind and body are. See, that is one aspect. First of all, I am saying, if you want to conduct anything well, will you conduct it well if you know everything about it, or will you conduct it well if you know nothing about it? That's all. You talk... you want to stand in the grocery line. If you are smart, you will never stand in the grocery line. I have not stood in a grocery line for years <laughs> All right, in... for decades. Right. Why? Because you grow your own vegetables, you, you, you have a green thumb. It doesn't matter, but somehow <laughs> you will not end up doing basic things for the rest of your life. You will get to do something better, because every human being is wanting to do something better, wanting to do something bigger, wanting to live bigger, yes or no? Yes, but I don't think many human beings are willing to activate on their desires. I say this all the time, everyone wants bigger, better, Yes, yes, faster, that's the whole thing. More expensive, more valuable. They are only complaining like this. Right, but aren't willing to do what Those it who are to willing to happen. understand what is the nature of their life and act upon it. So, so the, so the curiosity that would lead to the answer to that question, and it also, it sounds like what originally drove you to meditate on that mountain, because I know, again, at 25 years old there, you had a, like a spiritual awakening where you said every cell in your body was some sort of ecstasy, you had no sense of time and you kept having these revelations and, and one time you sat outside for 13 days and you opened your eyes, you thought it had been, what, I think you said 25 minutes? So did that sense of curiosity, is that what led you to, to, to go down the path you went? See, we must understand, it is intrinsic to human intelligence to want to know something more than what is there. If you leave your dog out here, He's just sniffing out everything. Even he's curious, he wants to know everything that's there in this garden. What's wrong with the human beings? The only thing that's wrong is they've... they've arrived at too many conclusions, either because of religious beliefs or philosophical beliefs or ideologies or some nonsense that they've concluded and they've lost the sense of the intrinsic nature of your intelligences, wants to expand, wants to know. This is not somebody has to teach it to you. This is natural, you leave a child, it wants to look at everything, isn't it? So where did you lose it? Because you made up your philosophies of uh, socialism. I... Uh, if I can just riff on that just for a second. For, for me, when I was growing up, a lot of my friends called me, like they gave me the title of truth seeker. And it was because I asked so many questions for a lot and see and try to poke holes in, in what a lot of people would say. And I... You're really see... unplugged, huh? <laughs> <laughs> just plug in. You can do it. I, I believe in you. <laughs> Carry on. And so, you, you speak about how creating conclusions and beliefs about the world, when if you really scope out and take a macro view of like, we really don't know what's going on here within humanity. If we scope out and we see that we're a blue marble hurling around a gas of fire at incredible speeds, it's like, take yourself back and realize that the beliefs that I made about, you know, just dogmas and, and religions and politics and everything that you hold so close, is hindering us from being able to look at things for what they actually are. 
And so if you could just speak on how creating beliefs and conclusions about everything destroy our ability to seek, I think it would be very valuable. See, when you say, I believe something, what does it mean? I'll ask you a simple question, can I? Sure, of course. Extracurricular question <laughs> How many of you believe in God? Just raise one hand. Okay. How many of you believe you have two hands? Just raise one hand. Do you believe you have two hands? No, of course. One will do, one will do. Just to prove yeah. it. So I'm asking you, do you believe you have two hands or do you know that you have two hands? Both. Really? Yeah. Oh, both. If you know you have two hands, where is the need to believe you have two hands? One follows the other. No. Why not? If you know something, why do you have to believe it? If I know something, why do I have to believe it? Yeah, you because know it? I, I believe one follows the other. No, no. I believe the truth. I have two hands, that's the truth, I believe it. See, see, the word believe means, the word believe essentially means you do not know something, but you believe it is so. Sure, but you could believe and know something. See, I believe you are a good guy. What does it mean? So you don't know that. I don't know <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm saying, I don't know. I don't know what you okay. are, but I believe you are a good guy. Okay. I believed he is nice and I went to him and he was terrible. So are you saying forget about the belief and just no, no, I'm to not what saying. we know? But first understand the distinction between knowing something and believing something. Got it. So whatever we do not know, it is most wonderful of you and human of you to see I do not know. Because I do not know is a tremendous possibility, tremendous possibility. The moment you destroy I do not know, your entire learning and expansion process has come to a cease. And this is what you're doing with your belief that you believe this, you believe that. All these days people were saying, I believe God. Now they're saying in California, I believe in myself. I don't know what that means. Ooh, I believe in God and I do know that there's a God. Hmm? So you're saying to sacrifice my belief? I am not asking you to do anything. I am asking you to look at the distinction between knowing something yeah. and not knowing something. But do you feel like this would be tricky for Christians saying that uh, you don't I don't know want to get God. into a religious debate here. <laughs> All I am saying you is, up religion. there is no, no. I am talking about belief. I didn't even talk about religious you belief. You said other religions and nonsense. When? Like right before you got into this room. I don't think you said that. Yeah, I promise. I could replay it. I don't think you could. I don't think you can. Could. You can say that. I didn't say I'll, I'll, that. I'll, I'll check it, but yeah, I promise. No, he goes, yeah, but yeah, I promise. <laughs> Look, can I? Can I? Ask you this believe thing? that I said it? <laughs> I didn't <laughs> say it. Yes. <laughs> 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 We knew this was going to happen today. We're not experts. Just bear, just bear with us. Now, let me, I'm going to stand by my co-host here. He's going to eat shit on that one, okay? What is the, me what is the metric for, with, for which something goes from belief to knowledge? Is, is the not knowledge. I just want We're to talking about knowing. Right. So let me just make the, a distinction between knowledge and knowing. Okay. Is the knowledge is an accumulated information. I know this, this and that by knowledge means I have accumulated information. Today everybody is knowledgeable about everything. This doesn't mean to say they know it. They know it through the phone screen, everything in the universe, but they don't know it by experience of anything. So knowing is by experience. I have two hands, is my knowing. I know it is there, all right? Even if I close my eyes, it's there. If you argue with me, it's there. It's there anyway. So belief is something else. Right now I know something. I do not know something. These are two facts of life. So, if you live in truth, you will know some things, you will not know some things. What you do not know, naturally your intelligence will want to know. You don't have to seek it consciously. The moment you see I do not know, your intelligence will start working. The in-between thing is, what you do not know, you want to believe and make yourself feel like you know it. And that's caused tremendous trouble to human beings. Assuming things that they do not know. I think that's uh, one of the biggest problems we're facing right now in our country. I don't, I don't know how long you've been here, but um, I think it's safe to say America's probably the most divided it's ever been, especially with the pandemic going on. Well, you had a civil war, this is better than that. Yeah, it is better than that. <laughs> but I wonder how close we are to something like that happening. No. Like, like truth, truthfully, we... At least in time, it's... everybody gets hot, it's okay. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I wanted to build off sure, of his, sure. his knowing versus believing. 
uh, I, I don't remember which school of thought, if it, if it was Plato or Aristotle, but um, do, do you believe that all knowledge comes from what is gathered by one of the sensory uh, uh, parts of life, by one of the senses? Is that your belief? You see something, you believe it, you smell something, you believe it, or is there, a, or is there room for faith? Is there room for metaphysical understanding of, of certain things? Do you leave that open, or do you have to experience it through one of the senses? See, uh, if you go by your sensory perception, right now I touch this and I say it's cool. No, I don't know what this is. Only because it's cooler than my body, I'm saying it's cool. If somebody else who is much cooler than me <laughs> touches this, they'll say this is warm. Yes or no? Yeah. So I'm saying, your experience of senses is a very relative experience. It's good enough for survival, not good enough for knowing the nature of what it is. For survival process, you're seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, which is what you're saying. To go to the grocery store, all this is good enough. But if you want to know what it is, you cannot know through your senses. How do you know? I want to get into that. How do you find out what it really is beyond your senses? What's the what's the practice that gets you there? <laughs> it's not about a practice. First of all, see, if you want to cross a border, first you must get to the border, isn't it? Right now you want to go to Mexico. You can't go from here, you must at least get to the border first. So if you want to know, this is why I started with the border. But uh, you went into something else. I said the border of your experience is sensations. If something comes and touches, it's a sensation. If you see something, it's a certain kind of sensation. If you smell something, it's a certain kind of sensation. Everything in your experience is sensation. It may not be sensational, but it is sensation. That is why we are calling them as sense organs. They create sensations in the system. These sensations are vital if you want to live in this world, if you want to survive in this world, otherwise you wouldn't know anything. Suppose you had no ears, eyes, nose, nothing, would you know what is here? Nothing, isn't it? Total blank. You fall asleep, what is happening? Your heart is beating, your liver is functioning, kidneys are functioning, everything functioning. Now they're telling you even your brains are functioning. But you don't know thing, simply because all the five gates of sensations have closed down, isn't it? So your experience of life is right now limited to sensory perception and that is the reason all this confusion because the nature of sens sensory perception is such, if you see this part of my hand, you cannot see this part of my hand, isn't it? So you always perceive everything in parts. Now with these parts you are trying to make a whole, it doesn't work like that, right now people's understanding of what creation is, what existence is, is it's a trillion piece jigsaw, but they find three pieces, put it together and they form something and say, this is it, this is it, I believe this is what it is. You can believe whatever you want. If we work hard enough on you from your childhood, we can make you believe any damn thing in the universe, just know this. Right, I agree with that. Is that a shortcoming of humanity? Is that, is that, is that because our brains have not developed to a point where we, we are no longer limited by what we see, feel, touch, smell, hear? Or is there a way to break that boundary and have you done it? See, uh, human brain, there's nothing deficient about it. The deficiency is people are trying to operate without using the user's manual. They don't know a damn thing about their brains. That is their problem because they have lots of beliefs. They have lots of beliefs and beliefs and beliefs, so they can't use their brains. But the moment you see, I do not know something, do you see your brain starts working in a certain way? Huh? I, th I think saying, I don't know, is one of the most powerful statements in the world. It starts way. exploring immediately. It's through exploration. You have come to America, I'm saying, <laughs> isn't it? People came to America because of exploration, not because they believed. Nobody believed there was a land here. They thought they were going to India. Yesterday, somebody asked me, what is, what is your experience of, uh, uh, you know, that Columbus uh, landed in America and called the people here Indians? What do you think about it? How do you feel? I said, I'm glad he didn't land in India, but I'm sorry he landed here <laughs> you, you talk about this uh, necessity for curiosity and, and the 
this uh, I don't know or questioning. See, the... don't use the word curiosity. Okay. Curiosity is a very surface thing. Okay. But when you realize I do not know, there is a pain of not knowing. It, it, right, just... and it leads and it leads to that to that questioning, right? One of one of the things that I, uh, uh, some people use that aren't as uh, you know that don't sit on a, a meditation uh, system to get to that place of curiosity, sorry, to get to that place of questioning and not knowing and being open to looking at things in new Can ways. Can I supply some vocabulary? What's that? Seeking. Seeking, thank ah. you so much. Like I said, brand new to this. One thing some of these people use is uh, mind-altering drugs. Ayahuasca, psilocybin, sergic acid. What are your thoughts on, on getting to this, uh, to this place of understanding through alternate means? The, uh, it's like you can jinx the brain to create all kinds of experiences. Just by strongly dreaming about it, you can do it actually. People do it. You can hypnotize somebody and make them go through all kinds of things. If you're only hunting for experiences, it's fine. But what I'm talking is not about hunting for experiences a genuine exploration. If you put on a VR and sit here, you may go to Mars right now. But you've not gone to Mars, that's all I'm saying. So by making some chemical changes forcefully, by introducing something, whether it's of natural orgi origin or it came from the back street of uh, something, it doesn't matter where it came from, you stimulate something chemically and an experience happened. If you... If you did it just one time and you, you use this as a way to understand that I'm capable of these ex experiences. You know, yesterday I was just doing the daily quote today morning. The quote was something like this, if I can repeat that. Uh, it is like, whatever was the most wonderful and the peak level of emotion or experience you had, make that your baseline in your life because you're capable of that, all right? You're capable of that, what you're capable of must happen. What you're not capable of will not happen, that's a different matter. What is... what you're capable... if you're level... if you're capable of a certain level of joy, that must be your baseline. Now you will explore what's beyond. Now most people think these peak experiences happen only when somebody loves me, only when I pop this pill, only when I smoke this stuff. This is the wrong way to do it. If you used it just once to understand that my body and my, uh, you know, experience is capable of reaching such a peak and then you start living there, that's great. But every time you have to pop something and tomorrow you're sick, what's the point of that? <clears throat> so I have your peace and happiness. I know I've, I've asked you all, what do you truly want, right? What, like, what do you truly want in this life? And we, in the 3D material world, are chasing a lot of things because of the feeling that it's going to give us, right? And so peace and happiness seems to be the answer amongst a lot of people that I ask. And I hear you talk about how peace should be the fundamental baseline foundation in which you live, not the highest aspiration. So if you could speak for people that don't have that peace currently within their life and want that to be the basis for their whole life, how can they do that? See, uh, this is the most unfortunate thing in the world, that most human beings just do not know how to be at ease. They're not even at ease. Forget about joy, forget about blissfulness. There is no ease. They're all in this jangled state. And now they say, this is how human beings are. Doctors say, because that's their business. Pharmaceutical companies say, that's their business. See, for example, United States, we're here in USA. So let's take this as an example. This is the most affluent country on the planet right now. Why does an individual person or a society or a nation seek affluence? In the first stage of affluence, it's a choice of nourishment. I can eat what I want. If I'm hungry, why I'm thinking of money, why? Because if I have money, I can eat whatever I want. In the second level of affluence, it's the lifestyle. I can live the way I want, I can do things that I want to do. So now in the most affluent country where there is a choice of nourishment and a choice of lifestyles like nowhere else, why are you spending 3.25 trillion dollars as your health care? Something must be wrong with you. Hello? When you have a choice of nourishment and choice of lifestyle, why are you sick, I'm asking? 3.25 trillion dollars is more than India's budget, all right? Annual budget for 1.2 billion people. 
So where do we go wrong? Well, that's what we are looking at. <laughs> no, it's not about greed. The problem is without understanding, if you do not know how this camera functions and you use it, I'll assure you this is going to break down in three days. Yes or no? One who knows it, they may use it for a lifetime. One who does not know it, will break it in three days, yes or no? That's all you're doing. No, no, it's not about them. <laughs> you are in charge of your life, you don't know a thing about this. Because you think by fixing the outside world, everything will be okay. Because roads are done, bridges are done, airplanes are flying, you think everything is done. No. A human, ex human experience essentially happens from within you. Outside conducive atmospheres we want to create, that is there. See, it's like this. If... if you look at it, he articulated this in one way. Essentially, what is it that you want? You want pleasantness of the body. If body becomes pleasant, we call it health. Do you want it? So badly. Yes. So if it becomes very... if it becomes very pleasant, we call it pleasure. If man becomes pleasant, we call this peace. If it becomes very pleasant, we call this joy. If your emotions become pleasant, we call this love. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it compassion. If your very life energies become pleasant, we call this blissfulness. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it ecstasy. If your surroundings become pleasant, we call it success. Only to create your surroundings in a pleasant manner, you need the cooperation of all these people. But for pleasantness of body, pleasantness of mind, pleasantness of emotion and energy, it is one hundred percent your business, yes or no? Yep. So only to create pleasantness around us, we need... Uh, because there are many forces involved, we need help from them, we need cooperation from them. Otherwise, anybody can make it nasty right now. But what happens in your body, what happens in your mind, in your emotion and your energy is absolutely your business. If you take charge of this, creating pleasantness in the atmosphere, you're at least competent to do it. Otherwise, you're always at somebody else's mercy. Why everybody wants to meet the most wonderful person? Why? I'm asking you, why the hell are you not that wonderful person? Huh? Why are you looking for that wonderful person to mess them up? <laughs> Andre, Andre brought up something uh, which is, is near and dear to me, and this is uh, this fight or quest for inner peace. And, and I, 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 <laughs> you speak about this a little bit, and you speak about um, people's inability to, to understand and, and, and to not ask the right questions or to not seek properly. What are your thoughts on underlying mental health conditions as a... Uh, as a combatant to people's ability to find that inner peace? Do you believe in, in true mental health as scientifically diagnosed? Are you not a believer in it? I'm not a believer or a disbeliever of anything. I'm willing to look at every aspect of life as it is. Is it okay? Everything's because okay. You... Who am I to say that it's not okay? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> because you're continuously coming back to belief, belief. Do you believe this? Do you believe that? I don't believe a damn thing nor do I disbelieve anything. What happens when you die? <laughs> <laughs> do I want that laugh. Why, why are you making me die? Why don't you ask that question with what yourself? Happens when, what happens when I die? <laughs> <laughs> some... <laughs> some things you know best only by experience. So you want me to die right here, right now? Come no, because you want to experience this it. This will get a lot of views, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> and I won't do it. Uh, but seriously, do you... so you... you... based on what you just said, technically you don't have a belief on what happens when you die, but surely you think... I ju I've just this year, in the month of February, I published a book called Death, which is on a top seller selling list for the last ten months, continuously. The book is titled as Death, an Inside Story. It's only for those who shall die. That's, that's, that's gonna great be, marketing. That's gonna great be marketing. That, how could Everybody's they like, this book is for me. 100% <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> You're a great marketer, Sugman. <laughs> what happens when I die? Am I, well, I... well, maybe not me, but what, like, does one go to heaven? Well, which heaven you want to go? Because every religion has their own heaven. This is where it gets tricky. Now, now, See, now you've... I'll tell you, I'm because you do not know what is in the heaven, let me describe it to you. 
Uh, in the Hindu heaven, food is very good. If you're a foodie, that's where you must go. In the other heaven, there are, uh, you know, long uh, white gowned ladies floating in the sky. You like that means, you go there. That was Mike's. Well, I like food. In another <laughs> place, in another place you'll encounter virgin problems. If that's what you're looking for, you go there. But what do you have to do to go there? You got to die first. That's an important thing. When you die, depending on your culture, we will either bury you, burn you, cut you and throw you to the birds, do something with your body. Because this body is a piece of this planet. When your job is done, you must put it back. If you've not done anything eco-friendly, at least this much you must do, put the damn body back. Some people are talking about going to Mars with it, all right <laughs> You must put it back, that is one sensible thing to do. I'm telling everybody in United States, I know I will become very unpopular. Why are you wasting cutting a tree when a man dies? At least plant a tree here, because you make good manure. Have you seen those, uh, have you seen those sacks? <laughs> have you seen the series yes, of tree there's, pots? There's these sacks yeah. you can place your body in yep. and a tree will grow. I know you don't need a sack also. In India, we just wrap them in a cloth with salt and everything and we put them there and plant a tree, all right? I gotta ask you, is Mars out of play? Like in, in the way of that you seek? Uh, well, how can I ask this question properly? Like if I get buried on Mars, mm -hmm. is your, Mars uh, out of play? Your body material, Unless you want to be exported to another planet, you this material you picked up from this planet, when your job is done, it's best to give it back because it's just a loan. Well, the some girls mother, that... No, no, Mother Earth gave you this body thinking that you will use it for your well-being and put it back when your job is done. You want to steal it and run away somewhere. Well, put some girl at Whole Foods once told me that I was just made of stardust. She was very convincing of it. She said, we're all just stardust. <sighs> all right. <laughs> I guess she's wrong. <laughs> Wait, I, I guess what I'm getting at is this, like... I, no, I, let's, I, let's finish this. Okay. So, uh, these are all different offerings in the heaven, sure. but the, this thing is you must die first. When you die, we put your body here no matter what, in which form we put it, we put it somewhere, either in a sack or a box or a whatever, we put it here. So, you went to heaven and you don't have a body. Now, what do you do with good food and virgins, I'm asking? Oh, if you have no body, how could you take advantage of the good food and the virgins? I yes. thought just like your, it's like spirit food. Well, well, here's why this is tricky, because say, <laughs> say you die at a very young age. Seriously, this is where I get confused. What goes to heaven? Your soul? Great. Is your soul, is it... Which is soul, your, right or left? <laughs> the left soul on my shoe. <laughs> the, is it the soul... Say, say, unfortunate, something unfortunate happens, a five-year-old dies. Does the, fi does the soul of the five-year-old go to heaven or hell see, as a five-year-old five soul? See, the, prob as the, soul see, the problem is there is, no, there is no line between what you know and do not know. That's why all this confusion. Right now, you do not know the nature of your existence, but you're talking about a soul because somebody told you so. I'm not questioning whether it's true or not. All I'm saying is you do not know. Hello? Somebody may be... something may be true, but you do not know. That's the important thing, because unless it comes into your experience, it's not there, isn't it? See, right now, if I close my eyes and sit here and doze off, all these people don't exist, because they're not in my experience, isn't it so? It's only what is in your experience which is true for you, rest you're just assuming. If you concretize your assumptions, that's called belief. So you... You say chase experiences? Are you afraid of dying? <laughs> Do I look like that? <laughs> it looks like you're a person who loves life. Uh, see, life is not my decision, life has happened to me, okay? If we were able to cause life, that's different, we didn't cause it. Something much bigger than us caused life for us. Now. It's your business to see that it happens at the highest point. Because you've been given an intelligence, you've been given a capability, you must see it happens at the highest point. When I say highest point, not in a social context, but within you, you must be at your peak. Otherwise, you're a wasted life. Can I... Uh, can I take a you second? have concerns, 
that you have to pay your Verizon's bill. So you go with a long face in the street. No, the, the thing is just this. Right now, the only and only and only thing that you have is life. Rest is all your assumption. Can I take a second to uh, get sort of personal? And um, Andre, you did a... Uh, someone brought it up at uh, your event. Um, the story of your wife was... It's not a story. The, the, the reality of your wife. Of, mm -hmm. of your wife and I don't know how to fathom what occurred, but it's kind, it kind of goes along what you were just talking about, about living at the peak. And on Saturday, I heard you speak, or Sunday I heard you speak, and you, you talked about her having the desire to go at what she felt was her peak. Mm -hmm. And in meditation, correct me if I'm wrong, in meditation, she made the conscious decision to leave this planet. Is it a question or it's a statement? I'm trying to phrase, coming from someone again who's just gotten immersed in this world, having that level of, whether you want to call it enlightenment, connectedness, knowingness, seems unfathomable mm -hmm. to me. See, uh, you're living in a culture where the only dream is to survive better than somebody else. In the last two hundred years, that's been the only dream, how to be better than everybody else, survive a little better, have a little more than everybody else. But you're also, right now, you and me are sitting on a land where for people, the distinction between life and death was very thin in their understanding and experience of life. The Native American people lived like this. I was amazed to see that only recently I discovered that they are talking about a doorway in... on top of the head. They're saying there is a doorway. They call it by something of their own language, I... what? Okay? Kapavi, which is a doorway that you can open up and leave. It is through that life came and it is through that you can exit. This is a well-established science in India. And there are any number of yogis who left their body, like this, sitting among people, announcing to everybody, today I will leave and just leave. Like taking off a pair of clothes. Huh? Like taking off a pair of clothes. Yes, of course, because you put this on. You put on the body, isn't it? Slowly over a period of time. If what you accumulate, if you can't put it down, are you stuck or no? Suppose you picked up this vessel and you cannot put it down, it's stuck to your hand. Is it a good thing? No. So similarly, you put on this body, it's stuck to you. You don't know how to keep it down. That's a terrible thing. That's what people are suffering right now being stuck in their bodies, they don't know what to do. So, what Mahasamadhi means is, it's not that they left and went to another planet or something, they just dissolved as a person. There is no persona anymore. So, it's a different dimension of life. I think this is too light and uncommitted atmosphere to debate or discuss such a thing. If you're interested, I will talk to you in a different kind of atmosphere, where there would be better understanding. And above all, uh, I don't want to casually discuss my wife with a whole bunch of people who don't understand what it is. Who don't sure. understand yeah, what it is. That's totally fair, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sure. <laughs> Again, I, I feel like that... Um can go over a lot of people's heads. Anyway, this question came up the other day also, it seems to be bothering all of you. Let me put it this way. Uh, the other day also somebody asked a question, I don't remember who, and they said uh, like this, it happened, uh, will you not marry again? So I'm saying, I don't come from that kind of background. Uh, one person falls off, pick up another one tomorrow morning. I don't come from that kind of thing, because life's melded in a certain way, and that person evolved to a point where I did not imagine that that person would evolve like that. 
beyond my imagination, beyond my expectation. Something was done, something that is considered so phenomenal and sacred in the entire uh, culture and in the yogic culture, it is always considered that way. So, when the atmosphere is like that, I don't want to sit and discuss my wife with all the people. Sure, I, I totally get it. It's, and I, I'm sorry if I overstepped any boundaries. I, I just, that whole thing is fascinating to me. And yeah, I think, um, you know, from, from religion to responsibility, from solace <laughs> to solution, I hear um, in these conversations, and I'm really curious with the privilege that we have right now in this gathering and with Logan's influence and the influence of many people that are watching this, they don't know where to begin. It seems like a lot, um, and, it, and it goes over their head. And so, no, no, Vicky, it's very easy to make it very clear where to begin. Uh, unless you hop in with in-between things like this. Right now, standing in the grocery queue is not even on his mind, all right? He's just throwing it because he thinks that is a philosophy which will counter everything. I want to tell you, I read my... Mein Kampf, when I was eleven, twelve, I become a strong uh, activist. When I'm just twelve, thirteen, and at fourteen, fifteen, I'm thinking of joining ar joining armed struggle. So it's not new to me that kind of logic, that kind of rhetoric, as if it's a solution for everything. Yes, intellectually, it looks like socialism, communism seems to be the ultimate solution. Please try it to enforce it and see what a mess it becomes. Go and see in other parts of the world where it's become an absolute mess, all right? So this is not because... this is not because I like something, you dislike something, it's not about that. Ultimately, when it comes to life, what really works for maximum number of people, that is the important thing, isn't it? Regardless of the <clears throat> success rate of communism or socialism or the grocery line way of thinking, right, that I'm stuck in or have not thought my way out of, uh, it is the way of things in this world right now, in, in many places, maybe not so much in other places. Um, what is the reason for that? Is it the teaching of the parents? Is it the education system? Is it mostly religion? Who is the main uh, uh, perpetrator when it comes to set belief systems? And as opposed to giving us a starting point for creating new belief systems, how do you create a desire for the teachers of the next generation to look out, think outside the box. See, uh, for a long time, in the name of religion, in the name of philosophy, in the name of ideologies of variety of kind, all sorts of things have been promised. And all the promises are elsewhere, not here. I'm saying, because you're all continuously talking about belief, if you believe there is a better place than where we are right now, up there, why are you not gone, I'm asking? Doesn't make sense to me. If you genuinely believe there's up there a better place than this, you should be gone, isn't it? Hello? Well, well based, based on the religions that people utilize to believe in this better place, we don't get to choose the day. The day is short. You can show choose the day. You can choose the day, it's very simple. <laughs> well, I think it just speaks into what we were talking about earlier, right? If we really knew that there was something outside after we died, there was a heaven that we really knew, if we actually knew, then yeah, I would want to go right now. Yeah. But because it's, because it's a belief, uh, that becomes a difficulty. I'd, li I'd like to hear George speak. Uh, that's, speak that's wrong. Uh, so like you said, life was given to us, so we're not allowed to take it. For example, I can't uh, take my own life and I can't take Mike's life. So redeem the reward that the Lord has given to me at the end of my time when he has chosen my time, not me. Because I haven't gone through what he need me to gone through. Fine. Go through. I, I agree with you. You have no... You or anybody has no right to take life, yours or somebody else's. That is a given, all right? But I'm saying, why is it that the idea of a better place than this has come is because right now people are suffering within themselves, all right? Why are they suffering? I want you to understand this, whether it's joy or suffering, essentially both of them are happening from within you, is that so? 
if it's happening from within you, what happens from within you, at least what happens from within you, must happen your way, isn't it? Very true. If it happens your way, would you be blissful or miserable? I wake up every single day blissful. Blissful, I would be absolutely. Do. Not presume, tell me. Yeah, if you had yeah. a choice, <laughs> would you make it pleasant or unpleasant for yourself? Pleasant. I'm pleasant. Not pleasant. Yes. <laughs> if you were feeling very pleasant, would you be always thinking of going to another place which is more pleasant? No. Right now, the entire human, this thing is set up on a better place somewhere else. Um, so before, like, because a lot of people, if I say this, people are going to comment down below, okay, I'm sure you feel that your place is great. But coming from a 2005, like, five, George, where I'm working at a nine to five every single day, and I do have a boss to answer to, and I do have bills to pay, and I do have responsibilities that I do not want to take part of, I still found those days just as joyful as the situation I have now because I, have, I invited the Lord into my life. So if you're saying, why don't you just go there now, I'm saying... No, I'm no, not I'm not here. saying you should go there now. No, but you're saying... No, I'm not saying you're saying, but I'm saying yeah. if that was the, uh, the idea of like, if, okay, if there's a better place in heaven, why don't they just go now? Um, my, my combat was, why don't you just bring heaven here with you? I think that's what he's saying. No, no, you're actually, that's ironically, that's what, you're both on the same that's page. That's what I'm saying. So I great. But I don't, I am still looking forward to something greater, but I'm also bringing it here. So I feel like religion can do that. And I feel like... See, I, I've never said a word, I don't know from where you're getting this. I have never said a word, this is it or that is it. All I'm saying is, instead of simply seeing what I do not know as I do not know, you're making up things in your mind. Now, is it true? that major religions on the planet, unfortunately, are on a collision course all the time. True, true, true. Why? Because I believe one thing, you believe another thing. After all, it's just belief, why don't we change it? The way it works. Because belief means you made it up. I, I think just the, the respect of you have your beliefs, I have my beliefs, we could still be on the same But plan. it's not worked, right? I mean, millions and millions, hundreds of millions of people have died in the last five hundred years yes. because of my religion versus your religion. Is that a fact? Uh, true. Yes. And I want you to believe, I want you to know this, that all these people genuinely believe that they are doing the right thing when they killed other people. They believed hundred percent. Right now, that man who goes and explodes himself somewhere, he believes... See, anybody who's, uh, who stakes his life for something, you can't question his integrity, isn't it? No, I'm willing to throw my life for something. I, you... I can question it, it depends what you're doing it for. for yeah, for I'm him. doing it for my God. Yeah. For him. Who's different than your God? Do you, do you see what he's saying? Yeah, but true, but if your God interferes with my life, then... So, that, so what you just described is why... See, exactly, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like I, wa I want you to understand, side. every religion starts off with this. If you worship the false gods, you must... What terrible things should happen to you? So... That has been the basis, unfortunately. What you think is right is... Ab this is absolutism. That you think this is absolute, everything else is not okay. I am saying, the thing is, the most fundamental thing is, if you're truthful, if you're sincere about your life, what you know, you know. What I do not know, I do not know. If you really look at it, you hardly know anything about anything, that's a fact. And just when you're walking on the street, if you do not know how you walk on the street, if you think you know how you walk on the street, is there a difference? You're a bulldozer when you think you know what... Uh, everything. When you don't know, you are a humble, nice, wonderful guy, isn't it so? Depending on what so. arena you work in, being the humble, nice guy may not always be the winning <laughs> tactic. <laughs> how, do you, how do you bring that humility into the sales world, into the stock world, or should those worlds cease to exist? So See, guru. you're talking to me like I'm living in some Himalayan cave and I've just come up. <laughs> I want you to understand, I'm running... I'm running an organization with over 11 million volunteers, with variety of activity across the world, all right? With various active projects which are every day have to be done, and businesses that have to be run, and the people on my hands all the time. So I'm not coming from a cave where I have no responsibilities, I have no nothing, I have nothing to manage, I'm sitting here and talking la-la land to you. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> so, you're, so, so, I guess, so, I, so I guess what you're saying is, uh, 
these exercises, these practices, this seeking is something that could be layered into the lives of just about anyone. Please tell me this. I'll do my best. It doesn't matter what kind of job you're doing, even if you're a soldier fighting a war, would it help to be very balanced, sane, joyful? And then you will do, even if you have to kill, you'll only do it to the extent you have to, nothing more, nothing less. Right now, people are taking pleasure in doing what they're doing, isn't it? Something has to be done sometimes, unfortunately, if the situations force you to do it, but you will do it only to the extent it's necessary. But if you are not in that state, if there is a certain level of uh, angst, there is a certain level of anger and hatred in you, you will do things beyond the limits of what should be done. This has happened all over the world. In the name of nationhood, in the name of religion, in the name of race, in the name of caste, creed, ra every kind of thing, in gender, every kind of thing. People have done horrendous things. Why? Because they believe this is it, that is it, absolutism. If you see, I do not know, you will walk gently. Absolutism is the devil. Can I say that accurately? You, you're getting religious once again. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutism no good. The worst. I, I have a question. Never taken a sip of alcohol, right? Hmm? You ever taken a sip of alcohol? I don't need to because I'm always drunk. Ever, Let's take, go. ever smoke weed? I'm always stoned. You've not seen my eyes yet. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh. I, I, so I know that. I know that. So, so, so straight edge. But I'm wondering, as a, as a fellow uh, person who's curious about life to the highest degree, or as you would say, seeking, how have you not had the desire to try? See, you are living in Los Angeles, you think that is where life is. No, sir, I don't. I'm <laughs> from Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why well, also I heard a lot of overdoses last two months. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, see, you are living in a certain society, you think this is the only way to explore. I came up in a place where I made sure I'm not influenced by anything, either whatever the religion around me, the family around me, the community around me, the pol politics around me, I made sure none of those things influence me. If nothing influences you, it's... see, I keep telling people, see, I, I'm absolutely uneducated. They think uneducation means not going to school or college, no. Uneducated means you did not pick up any ways of anybody's. You're simply the way the life is. Because your life, everything else is assumed. If you have experienced the nature of life that you are, and the source of life which is also throbbing within you, why would you try picking up leaves and weeds, huh? Aren't you curious? Are you, I, I know what, what you know through the weed, I know a million X over that within myself. So why will I be curious about something like that? Do you play with the teddy bear every day today? No. Yes, he does. Why are I you not... <laughs> yes. so good. Are you not curious how it feels, the child loves it so much? I went through the phase, I experienced it and That's decided... what, when you were a child it happened, right? right? Right. So I'm saying I grew up when I was four and a half years of age. But even like, even like the nature of psychedelics and the mind-opening experiences that you have... That see, right mean. now, these 11 million volunteers have gathered and nearly a billion people are at, in one way or the other touch with us. See, I'm not selling tickets to heaven. I'm not offering uh, uh, miracles pulling out gold chains from the sky or something like that. No miracle, no tickets to heaven, no anything. Why do you think they're gathering? Because I'm giving them dope. You're no, 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 listen, drugs. listen, no, 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 don't Real stop dope. it there because it'll be dangerous. I'm giving them dope that no drug dealer can give them. If they close their eyes, they are gone. I know you're big on semantics. Huh? So what is semantics? It is not semantic. Well, you're saying dope and it's not actually dope, it's not weed. So what is it that you're, that you're selling? Like, what is well, your mission? What's your... Well, there is a lot of scientific research which says there are millions of cannab cannabis receptors in your brain. You think they're waiting for you to smoke weed? I don't know. But they are there, that's a fact. So obviously, the system must have something to provide that possibility within the system. 
It is not that you have to go and pick something somewhere, it is here because this is the greatest chemical factory. If you knew how to manage this, you wouldn't be in the back streets. You would make it happen here. Getting high off life. Huh? Getting high off life. Tell look, look, that's I, understand, the body. I understand. I'm just saying like, I'm also a fellow curious person and I had the thought process that I cannot die on this planet not knowing what a psychedelic does to my brain. I, I, I've refused. That's something I, I, I wanted to try before I died and I did and I'm, I'm just wondering from a fellow person who um, is seeking how, how that See. doesn't uh, titillate you in some way. <laughs> See, the thing is this right now, uh, we are all sitting in the same place, breathing the same air, probably we eat similar food. At this moment what is happening within me, how I am, I will not exchange this for anything in the universe. You give me the world, I will not change it. That's how big it is. If that's happening within you, you won't go pick weed, that's all I'm saying. Uh, so, 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 okay, so I'm lacking. So, I'm curious because I'm lacking. You no, if uh, weed or whatever else gave you a little experience, you must understand, weed cannot experience, it's you who experiences. Weed might have stimulated some experience within you. Whether it is stimulated from outside or inside is the only question, right? If it is from outside, it always has a, a flip side of negativity to sure. it. If it happens from within, when they suppose there was... see, people are drinking alcohol. If there was no hangovers, if there was no liver uh, burning up, whatever, they would be drunk all the time. If you could be too fully drunk and fully alert all the time, would you do it? Everybody, I would advise them, drink alcohol, okay? <laughs> right now, that's all I'm telling you, there is a way where you can be fully stoned and fully conscious at the same time. I believe you, um, you're also much wiser. Than you don't have to believe me, here. you just have to check out my life, how I live. But I'm saying, <laughs> surely you in your early twenties, and I know, like you grew up in the sixties. So when you, before you had the spiritual enlightenment, there wasn't a part of you that well, he said he aged at four. Four, four. four so years you, old. So you're saying that us intoxicated, we're at a level here, but you sober are here, and you're teaching people that, and from your past conversation, you're saying that if you wanted to try it once to tell your body you could be here, that's fine, but if you're going to consistently take it here, that's wrong. You shouldn't be using a substance to get you to happiness. See, the, the choice is this. Suppose, uh, let us say, the compound wall of this house is uh, 25 feet tall. You've not seen anything outside of this, you always lived here, it was quite okay. But one day you went on a trampoline and jumped up and you saw there's a whole wide world out there. But for a moment and you came down. You again want to leap? This is addiction. You want to leap, leap, leap and have a little glimpse, little glimpse. So, what we do is, we don't put you on a trampoline because we know you will fall back. We teach you how to build a ladder. Nothing romantic about it, nothing exciting about it, building a ladder. You build a ladder, climb across the wall, the job is done. Why do you... What if I told you that acid made there be no wall? What if I told you that acid knocked that wall down into a pile of rocks and you were no longer in it? Would you do it? Yeah, I would do it. Would you do it? Yeah, I would do it. Would you do it? Yeah, I would do it. Would you do it? Yeah, I would do it. Would you do it? Yeah, I would do it. Would you do it? Yeah, I would do it. Would you do it? Yeah, I would do it. Would you do it? Why build the ladder if you never experienced the trampoline? See, the thing Before. is, that's what I said. It is not because somebody tasted a drug or somebody has got some teaching, somebody believes in a scripture or in a religion that they're looking. It is intrinsic to human intelligence to be wanting to be something more. That something more if it finds very physical expression, we call it sexuality. If it finds emotional expression, we call it love. If it finds, uh, uh, you know, mental expression, we call it uh, b what, conquest or shopping or whatever. If it finds conscious expression, we call it yoga. This is not decided by you, this is the nature of life, it wants to be something more. How you choose to see... If you know only money, you're thinking more money. If you know only these kind of experiences, you're thinking of more experiences. If you know love, you're thinking of more love. If you know knowledge, you're thinking of more knowledge. Whatever you know, you're trying to hit the peak with that, right? 
How do you know you found the one? Love. Uh, found the? I found the one. one. A found the one. The right partner. The right partner in life. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love that laugh. Uh, one uh, I want to laugh like that. One day. It's amazing. Do you need a beard to laugh like that? You have to. You have to have it. Yeah. You could probably start laughing like that. I'm too. close. Anyways. So anyway, this is not uh, United States, nor is it 2020. This is uh, 1990, and uh, this is India, where things don't happen like how it happens here. Yeah, but that's all. I just looked at her, and in three days we were married. So you're saying when you know, you know. So, so when you were rich uh, before. when I went home, uh, my I said uh, because I everybody thought I'll never marry because that was the contention because I was living wild. All the time I'm camping in the mountains, here, there, and I have no interest in such things. One day I went and said, uh, I'm marrying this girl. I said, what? Who is she? I knew her pet name, you know, like what she's called, I didn't know her full name. Then they asked, what's the father's name? I said, I don't know. I said, what? You don't know father's name? What's their caste? I said, I don't know. Then you don't know father's name, they, you don't know what the family is. How will you marry this girl? I said, I intend to marry only the girl, not the father. <laughs> <laughs> but did you know? I didn't know. You didn't know? What? Did you know did she, you was, know the she was the one? Absolutely. You knew. <laughs> but was there ever a time in the marriage where you were like, man, I picked the wrong one, like, this girl really is acting up? <laughs> <laughs> We don't do those things. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're pointing me because, in. Because uh, we are not... See, I, I want you to understand this. I know this culture is just built up now. If you're looking how to extract life from somebody, anybody, whatever kind of wonderful person you pick, they will disappoint you. Because you can't pick life, joy or pleasure from somebody else. If you're seeing that your life is an expression of your joy and you're seeing always how to do the best for the other person, it never will happen to you that, oh, did I pick the wrong one? Did I do this? Did I do that? So tomorrow suddenly you think this is the wrong tree and cut it off and put some other tree? It's stupid. <laughs> we look, I feel like we look for in our culture and it's the saying like, find my other half, right? Which in a sense is saying that we're incomplete by ourselves, right? And we're looking for joy in another being and I think that's the, really the key is just finding that if we can have two holes come together, right? And so I'm not, we're coming in, in union and relationship to not extract joy from one another, but to share joy within one another. How those guys become wise? <laughs> I've read your books. <laughs> I've read quite a few of your books. <laughs> Are we on time? I mean, I, I, I could probably sit here and ask questions all day. Well, he's probably got places to I need, go. I need some answers. Have you seen The Matrix? <laughs> Which pill would you take? Which <laughs> pill did you take? Or did you not take a pill? Have you seen The Matrix? Let's start there. Matrix. The movie? Well, I am The Matrix, huh? <laughs> you are The Matrix. Yeah. <laughs> he is selling he's dope. So wait, <laughs> he's, he's, like the he's, the he's the architect. He's the architect. Do you watch movies? I want, can, we, can we humanize yes, you, I you want as the <laughs> take well, you away uh, from this Gandalf-esque wish there was a time. for a second and humanize you? Do you eat cereal? What do you eat for Sun breakfast? Sadhguru, please tell me. <laughs> Well, I ride a motorcycle, you see. That's cool. Yeah. What kind of what kind of motorcycle? Well, I have a 1600 GT. It's a BMW. Oh, my, yeah. my dad has that motorcycle. He loves it. He loves it. It's he said he's he sold a pickup truck that I bought him <laughs> to buy the motorcycle. He didn't tell me he sold the pickup truck and used the money to buy it, something else that I didn't give him. So I understand the love for the motorcycle. What'd you have for breakfast this morning? Uh. Today? No, I just had brunch in the morning, not breakfast, because I I normally get, get to eat only one meal a day, so... What'd you, what'd you have? It's an Indian food. Indian food. What's your favorite American movie? Favorite American movie? Maybe Roman Holiday. Roman Holiday? I'm taking all the I nodded my head like I knew, but I had to... <laughs> How do you stay cool with so much clothing? Hmm? Because I'm cool. <laughs> okay. Very cool. Perfect answer. What's the favorite spot you've been to in the United States? I don't go by favorites, but in the last few days, what I've uh, ridden through, like the 
Arch National Park with the Bryce Canyon and the Zion uh, Valley. Oh, these are most amazing places uh, as nature goes. Utah, uh, most incredible. Have you ever had a near-death experience? All the time. Huh? How many? <laughs> Too many to recount. What was the always uh, people, people always uh, said, uh, if there's no danger, Sadhguru cannot exist. So always he's creating dangerous situations for himself. Me too. I punched <laughs> a window yesterday. I got nine stitches in my arm. <laughs> I just found out a Pokemon card was fake. <laughs> Do you know about Pokemon? I've heard. I don't know what that is. <laughs> it's a good investment. It's a good so investment. I, I think, I think we investment. have time. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, just due to Sadhguru's time. Again, I can't just like the, the, the privilege that we have here with this platform with, with Logan's audience um, and the millions and millions of followers and people that will watch this, is there something that, you know, advice or something that you see in Logan that you think would be most beneficial that would impact people in the most positive way? I know there are many things. <laughs> well, uh, compared to a lot of people, he's uh, very alive. If he channelizes that well, the good possibilities. But in the mode that you guys have taken, I don't know whether you guys will channelize now or much later in your lives, because life is a combination of two things, a certain amount of time and certain amount of energy. Time is rolling away. You do something, you don't do something, you're happy, you're unhappy, tick, 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 it's going away for all of us, it doesn't stop for any of us. We cannot say, today I didn't use it, let me roll it back. There's no such thing. Time is just rolling away. So the only thing that we can manage is our energy. Our energies we can manage in such a way, either it is, you know, very... makes your life very profound. These are two aspects when it comes to life. One thing is to make your experience of life very profound. Another thing is, your activity must be impactful. I think you guys are overly focusing on your activity being impactful, not invested on making your life profound. Because right now you think acid will make you profound, smoke will pro make you profound. Well, it gives you a facade. I didn't say that, I asked you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm saying it doesn't make your life profound. In fact, it makes you frivolous and it is also possible. I'm telling you, during my time, I'm saying uh, when I was in university, I... thirteen of my friends over a period of seven, eight years, thirteen of my friends died. Some to drugs, overdosing, some riding motorcycles too wild, you know, not knowing where the limit is trying to ride like somebody else, all right? You can ride to your limit. You can't do what somebody does. Somebody else may be doing something else. You must ride to your limit. You must know where is your limit and you stay on that edge and see how to push that edge. But you don't try to do what somebody else is doing right now. So like this, thirteen of my friends in seven, eight years' time, about four of them to drugs, remaining uh, nine of them to motorcycles, they lost their lives. They're all wonderful riders, they rode with me for many years. They're all... It's not like in United States, okay? This is like sitting on a mic uh, microwave, riding in United States. There is nothing, just put it on a cruise and you sit. This is not like that in India. You're riding, an elephant can be on the road, all right? And you need to be super alert and intuitive to ride at a certain speed. These are good guys very good at what they're doing. But somebody drinks and drives, you know, rides. Somebody thinks he can smoke and then ride, smoke up and then ride, like these kind of things. Or somebody, at any cost, he wants to go ahead of somebody, whatever. Essentially, not calibrating your energies right. Those who died, died. Many others, they became accountants, they became lawyers, they became something else. They're all my age now, when I look at them, they're all... They're all successful people. They got money, they got wife, they got kids, uh, all this, but no life in them. So this guy has got some life, let's see how he handles 
and manages his energy because time will run anyway, whether you like it or you don't like it, today gets over, tomorrow happens, tomorrow gets over, it's happening to all of us. So these are the only two ingredients you have, time and energy. What you make out of your energy is the profoundness of your life and also the impact of your work. Please, uh, all of you, make that happen for yourself. First and foremost thing is life should become profound in your experience. Then how you impact people, you don't have to worry. Whichever way you do it, it'll be for the best. But if you live on the surface and try to impact people, sometimes you will good, do good things, sometimes you will do terrible things to people, maybe with good intention. Because most horrible things on this planet are done with best of intentions, not with bad intention. Sadhguru, thank you for blessing us with your wisdom today. Can we get a round of applause for Sadhguru? <laughs> Thank you very much.